This is the last Temptation of John podcast, and as you know by now, I am the Apostle John. I want to welcome you to the show. Now, I'm currently reading through the trilogy of books I've written, and this is an audio book podcast. So if you haven't started with chapter one, I recommend you go back and do that now. In today's show, we'll continue with book one, and I'll read chapters 21 to 23. Listen, we're over halfway through book one of my diary. We're now on chapter 21. I'm calling this a bad rap. And the date is still June 22nd. And believe it or not, I actually got multiple visions today about... What's that? You have more questions? You, the listener, have more questions? But don't you want to hear about my vision? Oh, all right, go ahead, ask away. Okay, question one. If we are all immortal, why are Miriam and Alan so much younger than me? Ha, huh, that's a damn good question. I mean, have you seen me lately? Go to my website, thetemptationofjohn.com. Look at any of the pictures of me. Does any of that look like it would be fun to be this old? Question two. Why am I so old? I've often asked that question myself over the years. You know, a better question is this. Why in the hell did Miriam and Alan get to remain so young and good-looking? Why I had to grow old and haggard? If only I knew the answer. Again, I go back to me supposedly being Jesus' beloved disciple, and yet this is how he blesses me? I mean, that sounds like a pretty raw deal to me. Next question. Was it Jesus who gave immortality to all three of us? The answer to that is simple. Yes. When did he make Alan immortal and why? That's a good question. As for the when, here's another opportunity for you to read that great book I told you about before. It's called The Gospel of John. Pick it up. Open it up to chapter 11 and you'll see that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in that chapter. But surely you already know that story, right? That's the when of when he made Lazarus immortal. As for the why, I would say he did it for two reasons. First off, Lazarus was very dear to Jesus. I mean, we all like Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary of Bethany. By the way, don't confuse Mary of Bethany with Mary Magdalene. They're completely different people. You may not know this, but Lazarus even traveled around with our group as a disciple for a while. As for reason number two, probably the real reason that Jesus made Lazarus immortal is that Jesus wanted Lazarus to help Mary and myself with his project, which we call the commission. And I think that Jesus figured Lazarus would be the brain power behind the operation. If those two reasons aren't correct as to why Jesus made Lazarus immortal, then your guess is as good as mine. What's your next question? Well, when did he make Miriam immortal and why? Okay, Jesus, let's not get too obvious with our questions, right? Well, this one's a bit trickier, at least for me, because, you know, like I said before, Mary and I were never all that close. Despite the many centuries we have known each other, I just never liked the woman. Now, I'm sure she told me her stories many times over the years, but for whatever reason, I can't recall it now. Hey, I'm an old man. We're allowed to have selective memory, right? Next question. Was there ever something romantic between Jesus and Mary? Look, honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. Even though Jesus did spend a lot of time with her, especially near the end, Jesus never gave us any indication that he was nothing but the perfect gentleman. And in spite of my personal grievances against my Lord, I still believe Jesus was 100% a man without sin, and that, even if he was tempted, he never succumbed to that temptation. That being said, there are a lot of people and conspiracy theories that think the contrary. But I won't allow myself to get caught up in them. Next question. Was Mary of Magdala a prostitute, or was she the adulteress whom Jesus saved from stoning? Okay, I guess now I do feel a little bit sorry for Mary on that account, because she really has gotten her name muddied up over the years. Here's the facts about Mary of Magdala. 1. 
The woman you likely know as Mary Magdalene was a person whom Jesus did cast out seven demons from. Two, Mary did come from the village of Magdala, and that's a city on the southwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. And three, after Jesus exercised her demons, Mary did follow us around. However, unlike most of those he cured who eventually left our group, Mary continued to stay on and she got more and more involved. As for Mary's reputation as the woman of ill repute, I know the stories as well as you. There is Luke chapter 7, where Mary is supposedly the woman in the city who was the sinner. And then, of course, there's my gospel in chapter 8, where lots of people believe that Mary is the adulteress whom Jesus saved from stoning in my gospel. In point of fact, though, Mary is not either of these women. And if you read the Bible, you'll realize there isn't any evidence in the Bible to support those associations from Luke or my gospel. Now, if you want to know more about this topic, you should look at the article that's published on my website, temptationofjohn.com and look at the article titled Mary Magdalene, Saint, Sinner, or Something More. That's about as much help as I'm going to give to Mary. What's your next question? So how did Mary get such a bad rap? Well, here I must confess that I am partly to blame, along with James and Peter. For you see, the three of us were the early leaders of that new religious sect called the Way that eventually became Christianity. And it was very chaotic after Jesus rose up to heaven and left us to wait for his second coming. I mean... James, Peter, and I, we did the best we could trying to keep things organized as we spread the good news of Jesus and tried to gain more followers. But you see, Mary had her own designs. No, let me correct that statement. For you see, once Jesus left, Mary wanted to step up and be our new leader, claiming she knew what Jesus wanted. Uh, hell no, I'm not following some upstart woman. And the rest of the apostles agreed with me. But you see, Mary wouldn't listen. She went off and recruited her own disciples. I mean, she went off and even wrote her own gospel, the gospel of Mary Magdalene. I mean, what could we do? We had to stop her. So we come up with some rumors to discredit her. I mean, after all, the city of Magdala was a hotbed for prostitution back in our day. So if Mary became guilty by association, well, it just made our job a little easier. Unfair or not, our plans did work, and over time, Mary was discredited. But look here, the end justifies the means in my book. I mean, after all, the way turned into Christianity, and thereby did we apostles spread Jesus' message to the world. I mean, that's what he wanted us to do, right? What's your next question? Do I feel bad about destroying Mary Magdalene's reputation? (laughs) Not really. I mean, just to set the record straight, let me say a few good things about Mary to show you that I can be uh, fair and balanced. I mean, in fact, Mary was one of the few people who stayed around to witness most of the events of Jesus' last days. I mean, she was there to see his passion and even his crucifixion with me. She was there at Jesus' mock trial. She heard Pontius Pilate agree to his death sentence. And she saw our Lord beaten and humiliated by the soldiers and the crowd. Additionally, along with myself and Jesus' mother, Mary Magdalene stood on Golgotha to try to comfort Jesus while he was dying on that God-forsaken cross, even while all the other disciples fled away from their own safety. Furthermore, Mary was actually the first person to witness the resurrection of Jesus, and it was she who came back to tell me and Peter about it. In addition, I will admit here and now that Mary was also present when the Holy Spirit descended upon us all at that event we now call the Pentecost. So given all this evidence, it's pretty safe to say that Mary was one of Jesus' chosen ones. If she just didn't cause so much trouble back then, perhaps things could have gone better for her. But, as you know by now, Mary is not one to keep her opinions to herself. Too bad for her. Oh well. Okay, let's stop this charade. I've had enough questions from you listeners. Let's get back to our reason for being here. 
I mean, God is going to be pretty angry with me if I don't keep telling you about my revelations. And I've got more prophecies to share with you, so pay attention, please. Hey, John here again, and this is chapter 22 of my diary. I'm calling it, You Can't Always Get What You Want, which is definitely something I've learned over the last 2,000 years. The date is till, still June 22nd in my journal, and I'm going to continue my vision from the last chapter. Like I was trying to tell you, today I received not one, but two new visions. Well, one was more of a memory, and the other was a true revelation. At first, I was transported back in time to witness a conversation between Mary and Jesus. It looked like it was shortly before his death. By the look of the surroundings, it appeared they were somewhere in the hills of the Garden of Gethsemane. Why do you always talk of leaving us? Mary asked. Ever since we reached Jerusalem, the only thing you talk about is your death. Hey, as I, as I looked at this vision, I, I bet this was that same Passover day I was just thinking about a couple chapters ago. Yeah, I remember it now. It was about midday when Jesus and Mary walked off. Judas, Judas was away buying provisions, and the rest of us were up in that room preparing the dinner. I mean, how ironic. I was just thinking about that day. Don't you remember? Meanwhile, Jesus was talking. This is what the Father has planned, Jesus said. It is my destiny. But what about me? What about us? Mary her, buried her face in Jesus' chest. Stay with me. Together we can lead your flocks to salvation. Isn't that what you want? <sighs> this made me mad watching this vision. You see, I told you Mary always wanted to be the leader. Jesus held Mary close. You will indeed have a hand in helping the world find salvation, Mary. But your destiny is not with me. I must be about my father's business. You must die, Mary pulled back. You want your, your father wants you to die? Why would he let evil triumph over you? It doesn't make any sense. Much of life doesn't make sense while it is happening, Jesus wiped Mary's tears away. This is not the end. Once it is finished, you will understand. So, so you're going to just let the Pharisees kill, kill you? You're going to desert your disciples? D desert me? Desert the world you came to save? Jesus laid a hand on her shoulder. It is the only way, Mary. It's not! Mary pulled his hand away. It's not the only way. It's your way, and I don't agree with it. Oh, God, Mary was always a drama queen. You see that now, don't you? Meanwhile, Jesus replied still more softly, It doesn't matter what I want, Mary, or what you want. The Son of Man must obey his Father's will. You know this is the case. I know Gabriel told you so. Don't tell me what the angels said. Those visions are my own, given to me so that, so that I could change the future if need be. This is not one of those times, Mary, Jesus cautioned. Gabriel's words are a gift, and I will later bless you with another gift. You will use them in the future to help this world, but on this occasion there is no action for you to take. What will be, will be. I watched as Mary's shoulders slumped even further, and I could tell her heart was breaking. Jesus extended a hand to her. Please don't leave me in my time of need, Mary. I do need you. The pain was evident in Jesus' eyes as Mary looked at him, and I watched as Mary began to reach out a hand to take his own. But then, I would guess that here Mary realized that no matter what she did, it would not stop Jesus' death, and that the thought of him being crucified as he claimed was going to happen was apparently too much for her to bear for i watched as mary suddenly cried out in agony and ran away racing to escape her own sorrow i also watched as jesus sat there and jesus did not chase after her my vision took me after Mary, and I watched her seek out the secluded confines of the stone hills to lament her situation. 
Perhaps she was trying to work out a plan to change Jesus' mind? Perhaps not. Whatever her plans may have been, as it turned out, Mary would not see Jesus again until he was captured and then crucified, and by then it was too late for anyone's plans. And suddenly I wondered, did Mary ever forgive herself for deserting our Lord? And for a brief moment, I actually felt sorry for Mary. But then I remembered that great song by the Rolling Stones, You Can't Always Get What You Want. And so I opened up a bottle of one of the new beers I'd been waiting to try, Budweiser Copper Lager. And that took my mind off Mary and put me in a better mood for a while. Unfortunately, I couldn't enjoy myself too much because I realized I still have to tell you about that other revelation. John here again, and my marathon day of visions was continuing. I mean, listen, it's still June 22nd. This is chapter 23 of my diary. I'm calling this the vision of the skull, and things are about to get real interesting with this revelation. So after moving past that vision of Mary and Jesus, my second and much more interesting vision was pretty deep. Think book of revelations to put yourself in the right mindset. You know, as best as I could make out, I was witnessing some sort of future event, for I appeared to be looking upon the altar of the one true God at the temple of Jerusalem. Now immediately I spied Chief Rabbi Yona Metzger, Pope Benedict XVI, and Dr. Gaz al-Ridwan Mebu, and they were all together. There were hordes of people covering the hillsides, and I surmised that this was the much-publicized ceremony that Rabbi Metzger was organizing to attempt to unite these religions in this new era of brotherly love. I mean, it's hogwash in my opinion, but who am I to re object, right? But then my vision blurred for a moment, and when it returned, the entire mood had shifted. Something was off for the rabbi was now lying motionless upon the altar, and peering closer I could see that he was dead. Looking around I now noticed three crosses in the background. They had an eerie resemblance to the crosses back on Golgotha some 2,000 years ago, especially since I saw people on those crosses, people who were crucified. I strained my eyes to identify the victims, only to get a major shock, for the first body hanging limply on that cross was Lazarus. I turned to the second cross, and thereon I saw Mary of Magdala. Can you guess who was nailed to the third? <gasps> yes, it's always unnerving to see yourself as a bloody corpse, but over the years I've been stabbed, shot, and killed in so many ways that it doesn't affect me much anymore. Instead, what excited me about this vision was that perhaps, just perhaps, maybe this death would finally take. For if this prophecy was true, it seemed I was looking upon the event which I had been waiting for for nearly 2,000 years. My own death! Whoopee! Now, as I told you before, Mary, Lazarus, and I had all been made immortal so that we could stop the coming of the Antichrist. I mean, this was our great commission, and if successful, we'd be assisting Jesus in his glorious return. Unfortunately, it was a job at which we three had failed miserably, many, many times. For nearly 2,000 years, we'd been on our guard. And at various times in the past, my friends and I thought that the end times were approaching and that the Antichrist was walking upon the earth. Yet upon every occasion, we were wrong. Now, however, it appeared that I was finally seeing a different vision. For it was the first which showed the deaths of the three immortals, something I knew was the key to the end. Unfortunately, for the sake of the commission, again it seemed that my friends and I had failed, for in my vision the beast was very much alive, and we three were clearly dead. Oops. Once more my vision got hazy. When it cleared up again, I found myself riveted back to that altar scene, and someone was standing there. It was a man who looks like every man, and yet no man. 
He was wearing a crown of thorns and blood was raining upon his head. For a moment I thought I, it was Jesus, but suddenly I realized it was another, Dr. Ghazal Ridwan Mebu. Or was it? For his face shifted and I was left to wonder, Is it you, Lord? Are you Mebu? Yet there was no time to be sure, for now there was more activity over at the crosses. Something was being done to defile us. A figure in white was pushing a spear of some kind up into the sides of our bodies. And that's when I realized Lazarus and Mary were not dead after all, for I heard them scream as they got impaled. Did that spear finally kill them? I had no time to ponder the question further, for now the mysterious murderer was walking over towards me. Suddenly I entered my own body inside the vision, and I was looking down upon my would-be murderer, yet before I could make out his face, he impaled me too. Yup! I wailed. Even though it was a vision, it hurt like hell. To my horror, I realized just what we had been speared by, for this wasn't that infamous spear of Longinus. Instead, it was one of our nails, the nails of Jesus Christ. As I felt my true self being torn from this world, my vision shifted yet again, this time back to the altar. Dr. Mebu was there, and that figure in white was approaching him from behind. And finally, I could see his face clearly, for that figure, that murderer, was none other than Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. <laughs> Then it was that I made a shocking observation, for Joseph was actually carrying the nails in his hands, something no mortal had ever done and lived to tell about. Yet the Pope was doing it, and carefully I watched as he took each nail and installed it in the glowing new crown, even as Mebu was removing his own crown of thorns and Mebu's face was a picture of awesome power. He was literally glowing with victory. Meanwhile, Joseph's face showed a sly smile as he lowered the crown that was now filled with Jesus' nails down upon Dr. Mebu's head. Suddenly, there was a blinding light from above, and my vision expired. Breathless, I was left with but one thought. Can any of this be true? My God, was Pope Benedict going to be responsible for the death of Dr. Mebu? Wait, but which one is the Antichrist? Well, that's the end of our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, be sure to visit our website at temptationofjohn.com where you can read the full text version of this chapter. On our website, you'll find links to every podcast episode, and you can also join the Temptation of John Book Club. It's free to join, and you can get notified when new chapters are released. Again, you'll find all this and more at temptationofjohn.com.